Hey everyone, sorry it's been a while since my last video, but I'm back with a new video today. Uh, this is sort of my first crowdsource video, I guess, where it was originally submitted by someone in our community, uh, with some of my own comments and edits on top of it. Uh, this one was originally created by Chris from onemonth.com, uh, which is a website for learning uh, Python, JavaScript, and a few other languages. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at Columbia University. Looking through this video, I thought it's really high quality and it'll be useful for a lot of you guys, especially for those of you who are just getting started with web development. And that's why I decided to share it with you guys today. Uh, in this video, he covered topics like uh, what's a tech stack, backend, databases, and uh, front-end frameworks, and a lot more. So let's just get right into it. So a tech stack is basically this analogy of layers of how we think about a website. So really the top three are the most important here. The front end is what you see. So if you go to a website, right, everything you see is the front end. The back end or the server side languages, this blue one here, this is kind of the brain behind everything that's happening. And the database is where all the data is stored. So for example, if you come to the Zappos website, if you see the homepage, when you go there, what you see is the front end. Let's say you click on a shoe. You're like, hey, I'm going to buy a shoe. The next page you see, what you see is also the front end. But what you might not have known is that in between your clicking, there's lots of data being processed from the server to your computer and back and forth. And that processing is generally done by what we call the back end language or the server side language. Either of those are the same. And there's also this database, which tends to be represented by this little shape here, <laughs> this little icon, like a cylinder. Uh, and this is where the data is served. It's more or less like an Excel sheet. Think of an Excel sheet with rows and tables, um, rows and columns and tables, and it's where you put the data. So if you were to buy something, right, and log in, your data will get stored in this database. Well, now that we have just a high level, you know, understanding of these, these main terms, because I'm going to use them a lot. Um, the thing is that each of these layers has different languages that falls into them. So these are like become categories, right? For how we think about choosing our tools at the front end language, we have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, uh, on the server side, we have Java, we have Python, we have Ruby, we have PHP in the database, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So as we go through this, it'll be helpful to think of, um, think of these layers when we are, you know, putting together this idea, especially if you're asking yourself, which language should I start with? Cause maybe you're completely new to programming. So, Let's jump into that. And, and I will say kind of one uh, rule of thumb, which makes this a little bit easier is if you are just getting started, you're going to want to learn the front end HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, all three of those. And you're going to want to pick one server side language, right? One backend language. So for example, that could be Python and then one database. So this here, this here at the top, this is a really good place to start. I would say if you just wanted to stop watching right now because uh, you're like, that's enough, this would be like the main takeaways. Like just learn the basics of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, Python, and SQL, and that's a really good foundation. But like I said, um, there's lots of options out there, and you might want to know a little bit more about how those options compare and when and why to choose certain options. So that's what we're going to get into. Okay, so for the back end. There's three options that are very popular specifically for becoming a web developer. Uh, and a web developer in, in my mind is someone who is building websites, building interfaces, building, you know, maybe mobile apps as well. Right. Um, and just to distinguish that from somebody who's perhaps learning to code or program in order to, I don't know, do graphing or just some kind of AI analytics, right. We're talking specifically about websites uh, and apps in this video. And so for that, these are three of the most uh, popular options that are out there. So where do they come from? Python and Ruby, they've been around for, for quite a bit since 1991 and PHP as well. It's, it's from the nineties, like grunge error, 1994, you know, so these have all been around since the nineties. So one good thing about that is that, you know, they've all been tried and true over the years. They have been around. There are big communities for each of them and uh, they each have their pros and cons. So one pro of Python is that 
well, it is one of the most popular languages. And popularity is important in that if something's popular, it means it's probably going to be around for a while. It also means there's lots more books and job opportunities for it. So Python definitely has that going for it. But it wasn't always that way. Ruby, around 2007, 2008, was becoming one of the most popular of, of all these languages. And that's because there was a lot of breakout websites that started using Ruby, and specifically the Ruby on Rails framework. Sites like Twitter, Airbnb, Shopify, Hulu, a bunch of these sites. And PHP, it's kind of one of the older ones of these. Like, I know I said they all started in the 90s, but it has this kind of like legacy feeling to a lot of people because it's been around and got really popular first. So you'll see a lot of sites from like the early 2000s. So sites like Facebook, Wikipedia, lots of e-commerce sites. Oh, and WordPress, all built on PHP. So PHP is still used today, and it's it's had a lot of updating and evolution since then. Um, some people give it a bad rap because back in the day, it was so easy to get started coding in PHP that really anyone can do it. And because of that, there was lots of security vulnerabilities uh, back in the early code. A lot of that's been updated and fixed um, and really evolved since then, although the reputation <laughs> hasn't, hasn't maybe quite made it um, hasn't quite made it along in some in some arenas you know i think the people that use it still you know and that know it are feeling really really strong about it but it's just something that you may encounter um and at the same time be, you know because there's so many sites that had been built on it there's a lot of jobs in php um as well stack overflow publishes every year this survey that they do of um, many of the different people that read Stack Overflow and professional developers, and they put together this list of kind of kind of the best of the year. And just to give you a sense, you know, you can see here the front end languages that I mentioned, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript up at the top, quite popular, right? That's why I was saying, need to know it. Um, SQL, which we'll talk about in a second, which is the database language next, and Python, that back end language there. So as I was saying, you know, developers agree, <laughs> nine out of 10 developers agree, not quite, but you know, a lot of developers agree here um, that these are the main ones to choose. And then there are, you know, quite a bit of other ones. Why would you choose one over the other? You know, a lot of my students will ask me and they'll say, hey, Chris, you know, is one better than the other? Is Ruby better than Python? The real truth of it is it's not about better or worse. It has more to do with maybe, you know, what project you're working on. For example, if the site is already built in Python, it makes sense to just keep building it in Python for most cases, you know, or Ruby or vice versa. Um, in some cases, let's just say you wanted to make a blog. You're like, I know I just want to make a blog or kind of like a simple website with web pages. Well, for that, WordPress is a really good option. WordPress is going to save you a lot of time, you know, with all the upload functionality that, that a blog would need and text editors and all this stuff. Um, and so in that case, you're going to want to go with WordPress. And in that case, you're going to want to use PHP. So what you'll find is as you dig into, you know, the different things that are out there, you're going to see that different frameworks and different jobs and different websites um, in 2020, you know, are still going to be using PHP, are still going to be using, um, you know, s some legacy Python libraries and all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, that might be the reason why you choose it based on the job. Okay, so I wanted to add a few comments here. Uh, first of all, Chris didn't mention it, but Node.js is also another uh, good option for backend development. And uh, like Chris said, I want to emphasize that you know, the language you should learn really depends on the kind of job you want to get or the kind of project you want to work on. Uh, so if you're looking to get a job eventually, I would say just look at the job descriptions of the kinds of jobs you want to get and then look at, you know, what languages are required for those. And if you have, say, an open source project that you want to contribute to in mind, then look at what language they use and just learn that language so that, you know, you can contribute and practice. Uh, anyway, let's go back to the video. When we talk about databases, MySQL is still king. It is one of the most popular relational databases out there, um, followed very closely by Postgres and uh, Microsoft SQL, MS SQL here. 
NoSQL, which is a way of really having unstructured data. If, you, if you're new to databases, you can imagine that a database is like an Excel sheet, as I said, there's rows and columns, right? Um, and that's quite structured. If you've used a database or an Excel sheet, you have to name the rows and columns and things are kind of like, you know, <laughs> like stuck, right? They're like in one place. NoSQL, on the other hand, is a way of organizing your data um, where you don't actually have to, you know, label it beforehand. You could have lots of data and this gives you, you know, different opportunities of what you can do for accessing that data, for storing that data, for s speeding up um, collection of that data, lots of metadata, you know, data about data of what people are doing on your sites can all kind of be stored in something like MongoDB and, and I'd say MongoDB is the most popular um, still and uh, Couchbase is another another one that's gaining some popularity. Um, light a lightweight database. If you're just kind of looking maybe to do some local development, um, you may run into uh, SQLite. You know, SQLite is it's just light lightweight, meaning it's not a lot of complexity. It's not a lot to download or upload. You know, it's just it's just kind of simple. It's kind of the, the bare bones. And while you could launch a website on the web using SQLite for sure, it's definitely possible. Um, I think it tends to be tends to be for like small projects, you know, uh, or just kind of you know practice development that kind of thing. And here's a look at uh, the state of the databases. And you can see from this 2019 poll, we have MySQL leading with Postgres after that and uh, down and down the list from here. Uh, so here I asked Chris about how people should choose uh, NoSQL versus SQL. And he said the following. Uh, sometimes you don't have a choice between them. Uh, for example, if you're working with uh, WordPress, you might want to use uh, MySQL because that's the technology that works the best uh, with WordPress. Uh, otherwise, NoSQL can be a good choice in a few different cases. Uh, one example he gave me is when you have a lot of columns in your data. Uh, so let's say a hospital has some data on its patients, and each patient could have up to a thousand attributes. Then with SQL, you might represent that with a table with at least a thousand columns, uh, with each column representing each attribute and each row representing each patient. Uh, when you have data like this, instead of using SQL like that, uh, you might want to use a key value storage system in NoSQL, uh, kind of like that. Anyway, uh, let me know if you want me to do a deep dive on this. Uh, for now, let's go back to the video. When we talk about the front end, we have front end frameworks that can help us you know, design and make user interfaces a lot quicker. So why would you want that? You know, What problem does that solve? Well, just imagine that Every time you're making a new website, if you're prototyping or doing the doing the early versions of it, you know you don't want to have to choose the button color and you know the font size and you know all of the layout margins and everything every single time. It just takes a lot of time. So with a framework like this, um, in 2020 we have uh, Bootstrap is still leading as being one of the most popular uh, front end frameworks that are out there that will allow you to instantly just just kind of download this and get running with really just a nicely formatted and structured um you know well-balanced looking website you could just kind of put some any text any image and it's it's gonna look pretty good um, and that's what something like bootstrap brings um materialize you know i haven't used materialize um but i've heard i've heard it's pretty good and i know it's gaining some popularity um but bootstrap I, i've been using it for about 10 years now i want to say it came out about 10 years ago out of uh, out of twitter i have some developers from twitter and um and it's still it's still strong and i would highly highly recommend um, this be learned in 2020. JavaScript libraries. So in 2020, learning a JavaScript library is essential for a professional web developer. Now, there's a few different options out there, and I'm going to look, we're going to look at each of those briefly. Um, just a reminder, JavaScript is one of the most popular languages or the most popular language uh, at the moment, you know, according to the Stack Overflow poll. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is because of all the things that you can do now with these different JavaScript libraries. Um, so if you're not familiar with JavaScript libraries, which is one reason why we have them and, and one reason why they're so exciting is because 
now the way our user interfaces or UIs look uh, on a site like Facebook, let's say, um, is that we have different components of a website that are updating asynchronously, right? So, you know, birthdays or chat can update differently from stories, right? And you can see one part of the website update uh, or you can send data without the other components all changing or having to refresh. Um, a lot of these ideas have been around for a while, but plain vanilla JavaScript isn't necessarily so great at, you know, keeping this organized and some of these complexities um, scalable and quick and in check. And so that's where learning, you know, JavaScript first and then taking one of these frameworks to really build out user interfaces comes into play. Now, I'm using Facebook here as an example um, because it's it's popular use case that everybody knows, but also because it's Facebook that has built React, which is, you know, still the most popular um, JavaScript framework that's out there. Now, you can see Vue is, you know, technically has more stars here. This is star history from GitHub, you know, where people, developers and people that have GitHub accounts can just star and say they like something. Um, that doesn't really, I think, fully speak to the influence and power that React has in the space, because if you were to look at you know, just who's using React, it's based, you know, it's, um, it comes out of Facebook and Facebook uses it as well as just, you know, dozens of other really high profile companies. So, um, so Vue might be catching on in the next few years. It was developed by an ex Googler, but it's not, you know, from Google, like officially as React is, uh, looking at web frameworks just to kind of you know, put some of this in, in perspective. Um, you can see we have React here as being the number two web framework, uh, followed by Angular, um, and Vue is down the list quite a bit here um, as well. But yeah, you never know, um, you know, where things will go uh, in 2021, 2022. Um, Vue could definitely, you know, continue to catch up. Uh, also keep in mind, these lists, this list here is not just JavaScript frameworks. These are um, a variety of different web frameworks, um, but it does just give you a sense of how popular React is. You may be wondering why I didn't mention jQuery in the mix. Um, jQuery, you know, it seems to be around. It has a legacy following. Um, it's still used, but it's just not gaining in popularity, and it's really not it's really not the same for building UI and web functionality like React has. It's jQuery is more for uh, animation and loading, asynchronous um, data calls, and um, and a lot more that I would have to go into. But um, but yeah, definitely worth knowing. And if you are to work at a bigger company, um, even in 2020, um, people are still using uh, jQuery for sure. So. Um, so it's there, it's worth knowing about, but, um, but I would say, you know, if you had to choose between one of the two, uh, React is the way to go. Tools, uh, there's quite a bit of tools that you're gonna wanna know. Um, Git, Git is a way to commit, which is more or less like uploading and sharing your code um, so that you can make revisions over time and share that code with other people at your company or on the web. So Git, um, I would say start at github.com. There's some really great resources there. Um, FTP, probably just a basic skill to have. Um, we don't use it that much anymore on big, um, like a, a big company project wouldn't use FTP to upload uh, their website. But especially if you're getting started, it's just kind of like a, a handy way to upload and download files and share things. And sometimes if you're doing some simple websites or something with WordPress, it's sometimes just easy to know. And it you could learn it in like 10 minutes. It's not super hard to learn the basics. Um, something like Cyberduck is a free um, uh, FTP client that you can download and try that out. Of course, you'll need hosting to make that happen. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Command line, you're going to want to, the command line is that black box that allows you to um, write commands to do upload and download things with your code or execute commands on your computer. You're going to want to know that. Um, domain registration, these are three places that I go to buy domains, um, and these are all um, quite popular. Um, they've, they've been around for a while. GoDaddy um, has been around for decades now. Um, Namecheap is a lot like GoDaddy, but it's a little cheaper, so it says. Um, and DNS Simple is a, a great option if you, especially for organizations, especially if you're doing something with Rails or Heroku, um, I think it just makes the integration of, um, of 
launching and messing with the name rec uh, the the records the name records and everything um, a lot easier um, we use it at one month and uh, I think it's a really good enterprise solution for that reason uh, an IDE uh, basically or a text editor um, sublime has been a favorite for a long time and uh, I still use it because it's honestly just easy and simple um, but a lot of people uh, in the past year, past few years, have been moving to Visual Studio Code uh, or VS Code. And that's a really, especially if you're working on, on bigger projects uh, or using lots of dependencies, you know, bringing in lots of these different um, frameworks and tools, uh, it definitely makes coding a lot quicker in that regard. So um, I would say these are your two best options um, for 2020. Hosting, there's a lot of options out there. If you want an all-in-one hosting, you can use something like Squarespace or Wix or WordPress.com. This is more or less where you just go to this website and you get the front end, the back end, the server, everything immediately. You can just start, um, just start making a website. Now, the downside of that is you're not going to have too much access to actually touching the code or, you know, messing with the dials of how the server works or all that kind of stuff. Um, but it is the, probably like the most affordable and easiest way to just get started. Static hosting. Uh, static hosting is a way that you can upload your code. So um, it ends up becoming just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's the static part about it. Um, something like GitHub Pages is a free and really easy way to just kind of launch a home page and get a URL immediately. Um, and Netify is also another option you're going to want to look at there. Shared hosting. Shared hosting is uh, an affordable way to launch a website. Something like Bluehost or Media Temple are great options for that. And cloud hosting, uh, which is really, uh, I would say, essential for enterprise if you're launching, you know, a startup or something, a bigger kind of site for a company. Um, you're gonna want to look at Heroku, AWS, Linode, or DigitalOcean. Mobile dev. For for mobile dev, um, we're looking here not at the native iOS or you know Android Java um, frameworks, but we're talking about using um, you know HTML, CSS, and JavaScript these as our tools for making mobile for making mobile apps. Um, in this arena, React Native is is the clear dominant player here. So React Native, it's very similar. If you learn React you, to learn React Native, right? It's in that ballpark there, uh, followed by Iconic, Flutter, and Native Script. The thing that um, that React Native has again is just so many people using it, which really speaks to the community um, and you know the amount of attention that the that the framework is getting. So that's definitely one thing to really consider when you're picking a mobile uh, dev framework. Um, Flutter, on the other hand, um, also has you know quite a big quite a <laughs> quite a lot of big names behind it as well. Um, New York Times, Square, Tencent a few of these here. So I would say these are the two that you'd really want to pay attention to if you're just getting into this. Uh, if you want to go deeper, there's lots of resources on the web where you can go you know, deeper into the, the pros and cons and approaches of each of these. OK, now uh, that's it for this video. Uh, this presentation was, again, by Chris from onemonths.com. Uh, you can check out his website by going to onemonths.com. As I said at the beginning, I'm sorry it took me a while to get back on this channel, but I am back and I'm planning to make more videos in the future. So let me know if you have any video requests or anything like that in the comment section below. All right, uh, thank you as always for watching our videos and I'll see you guys in the next one.